Thank you again for this time and setting. Thank you for bringing your people together once again. Now God, we need you to speak to us and through us. Don't let us leave like we came. Give us a word that will make us better people, better saints, better Christians, better mothers, fathers, sisters and brothers, uncles and aunts. We need you, Lord, and we can't make it without, without you. Bless now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Anybody came ready for a word tonight? Amen, amen. Thank God for the prayers that have already gone forth in this place. Amen, amen. Thank you so very, very much. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Let's do these verses responsibly. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. you find these words. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophet. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Together. Amen. God bless you. Amen. I want to take text with the subject, religion versus truth. Religion versus truth. Now, I'm going to do my best to try to turn up, but it's really a Bible study here, but I'm going to try, try, try to turn up a little bit because I know some of you came for midweek worship. Amen. Religion versus truth. We live in a day and time where people claim to be spiritual and not religious. They have rejected religion, rebelled against it, and even ridiculed it. In some regards, rightfully so. Because Christianity and the way we view religion it stands for some repairing and some reforming. Especially and particularly when we have veered off the path of what is right and what is true. There are many who are more clone to their religion more so than the truth that God has shared with us. One of the most dangerous statements that you and I have ever heard is from Christian people, people who claim to know the Bible, who declares these three words, the Bible says. And because the Bible says it, it becomes sometimes dangerous because what we see in the Bible is governed by our interpretation. And there are times in which we are not interpreting God's word and God's truth right. And so people who hold the Bible dearly in the regards of believing they have the only interpretation and because the Bible says it, become dangerous people. I'll tell you another group of people who are dangerous. 
People who believe they got God all figured out. Watch those folks who got God all figured out. Nobody has God figured out. There's no formula for God. God cannot be placed in a box. God cannot be equated to if you do this, he will do that. Although we picked that up in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, in Leviticus chapter 26, uh, we, we get this ideal of if you will, I will. God shares with his people, if you don't have any images, if you don't reveal symbols, if you govern the sanctuary, and if you honor the Sabbath day and keep my word, he says, if you will, I will. But even in that, we discovered with Job that you can do all things right and still find yourself in a bad situation. B bad things will happen to good people. And so when we're uh, uh, of the ideal that we know the moves of God, we understand the moves of God. No, God is a mystery. And there is the mystery of God that you and I may not understand, know about, but we trust him as Job declares, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. And so as we uh, hear this saying, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual. Can you have faith without religion? What is your faith based upon? I mean, can I be spiritual and not have any form of religion? Is that possible? I want to suggest that your faith should take on some form. It should have some sense of foundation. As we practice religion, if we practice our faith with reading of scriptures, fasting and prayer, studying, coming together in worship, this becomes a practice which you and I engage in. But to just say I'm spiritual and there is no basis or foundation, could it be that Romans 10 and 1 declares that they have gone to their own understanding, that they have discovered their own righteousness and not have come under the righteousness of God? And so this issue tonight as it relates to truth versus religion, Jesus is addressing uh, the religious community of his day. And he has been accused of not following tradition or religion. He has contrasted their thinking and what they have believed and what they have known. And this litany of Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 that we read, this litany of Beatitudes is a contradiction to all they know and understand. Y'all stay with me here. They did not like the Beatitudes just as you didn't like the Beatitudes. I saw how you looked when I was teaching you. I saw how you shift in your seat. I saw your face expression even through your mask because we do not like the beatitude. Come on, y'all, be honest with me. Why we got to always be meek and merciful and forgiving? We don't like that. Why we got to be the one doing all the taking? Never the one able to dish out sometimes. Why we got to be always on our best behavior? Because the old teaching was an eye for eye and a two for two. If you violate someone, someone has the right to violate you. But Jesus come with this whole new language and this whole new message. And he declared 
that I have the word of God. And this word, this word that he gives, that he shares, they rejected as we have rejected. And in many cases, he declares in the scripture, you have heard, but I have said. There are over 64 versions in which Jesus refers to the Old Testament. And he declares, you've heard it this way, but I say unto you. They were more holding to their religion than the truth of God. And here it is in a nutshell. If you don't get nothing else I said, you will, you will get the message when I say this. This is it. You can take your nap and go to sleep after this. Here it is. Your religion should not shape your truth, but your truth should shape your religion. I'll say it again. Let that be your next tattoo. Your religion should not shape your truth, but your truth should shape your religion. And so Jesus is sharing the truth of God's word. A couple of things about the truth of God's word. First of all, God's word, number one, should be accepted. John 6 and 68 speaks of, then Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. That God's word, God's truth should be accepted. Number two, God's truth should be honored. God's word should be honored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet yeah. and a light unto my path. God's word or God's truth should be obeyed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Romans 2 13 mm-hmm. declares for not the hearers of the law that are justified before God mm-hmm. but the doers of the law shall be justified. God's truth should be defended. Jude chapter 3. Contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And then fifthly, God's word, God's truth should be proclaimed. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go ye therefore teaching whatsoever I have taught you and observing those things, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And so when we speak of the truth of God, Jesus gives this word as he says, I'm not discrediting religion. I'm not discrediting your tradition. I'm not tearing that down. I am only an extension of it. I am only the fulfillment of it. And so he gives his word beginning in verse 17. Look at it if you will. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill it. Jesus says, I'm not doing away with your religion, your faith, your practices, your heritage. I'm not doing away with that. I am just an extension of that. I am only fulfilling the word of God. Jesus was so serious about fulfilling the word of God that while he was dying on the cross, he made words and mentions of, I thirst, and Father, forgive them. Those were only fulfillment of the law, of what was written in the law. And we can go from Genesis to Revelation and see that the word of God was fulfilled 
and to be true. We have in our presence, we have the spoken word of God. We understand the spoken word of God in Genesis chapter 1 where he says, let there be. And we have the written word of God, that is the scripture, the Bible, the Torah, the Pentateuch. We have the written word of God and now we have the incarnated word of God. That Jesus becomes the word in the flesh. So if you miss the word, if you didn't understand the Ten Commandments, if you didn't understand the Torah, he has a word for you through the life of Jesus Christ. And that's why you and I have to be careful how we live our lives because we become an extension of Jesus Christ. And people may never come to church and never read the scripture, but they will read you every day in your walk and in your talk. And we become an extension of the word of God. Can they see the word in you? Does the word of God live in you? Are you a fulfillment of the word of God? And I tell you, I tell you, it's not easy to walk in God's word. We talked about in Sunday school this newness of life. and How we get to this newness of life. Well, we have to yield ourselves to the spirit of God. So that he can teach us and show us all things and how to walk and to live this life. J Jesus says, I'm not discrediting what the word says. I'm not discrediting what you believe. I am only an extension of what has been said and done. I am a fulfillment of the word. Therefore, there is no contrast between me and the Old Testament. There's no contrast between what I'm saying and what the Old Testament is saying. I hear you saying, well, there's a major problem here because the Old Testament is saying one thing as it relates to the law. And Jesus is saying love. How does love and law? Go together. But through the sovereign plan of God, he gives us the law in which we should abide and follow. But he also demonstrates a love that the law couldn't do. You see, the law could demand certain things of us. But then love and grace will help us do what the law demanded us to do. I wish I had a few of y'all in here. And so Jesus gives us this extension, not just the, the word, the law, because, again, one of the most dangerous people in the world are people who say, the Bible said, we're not understanding fully what is being interpreted through the word of God. Jesus says, I'm going to show you what the word is saying. Here is the beauty of Christ. The Old Testament gave us the written word. But it's one thing to tell me. But it's another thing to show me. I wish I had some help here. Now, I know we got some smart folks in here. We got some educated folks. And some of you can get it on the first swing. Some of you can read the instructions and you got it. And then there are other of us who need to look at the picture and we need an example and we need something to look at and to model after. Jesus said, look, I'm going to help my slow folks. I'm going to give you a model of what God looked like. If you want to know what love looked like, look at Jesus. You want to know what mercy looked like, look like Jesus. Because when the law was about justice and judgment, Jesus extended the law to make it believe and to make it uh, demonstrate love and mercy. Because if the truth be told, 
Where would we be? Y'all, we can go to church a little bit right here. Without the mercy of God. If it was just the law and to the letter, all of us will be dead and gone. But aren't you glad that even with the law, he sprinkled a little mercy? I wish I had about five of y'all who know we need mercy and grace. So we get the person of truth, but then secondly, we get the permanency of truth. Look what he says in verse 18. And I'm just about done, y'all. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tiller shall in no wise pass from the law until it is fulfilled. Now this might not mean much to you. The Lord says, my truth, my word is so permanent that not even the smallest punctuation. Not, 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 not talking about just the word. The smallest punctuation in the Hebrew. There are certain punctuations that will change the definition and meaning of a word. He says the smallest punctuation will not change. Until heaven and earth pass away. God's truth is more real than the bench you're sitting on. God's truth is more real than the building we're in. God's truth is more real than the sun and the stars. Because one day they're going to burn out. One day this building is going to be gone. One day the pews you're sitting on are going to be gone. But God's word. The grass with it. The flowers fade. But the word of the Lord shall stand forever. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. Shall not return unto me void, but accomplish that which I please and prosper where until I sin. He says before heaven and earth will pass away before one jot of my word shall fail. This French philosopher by the name of Francis Voltaire said that a hundred years from now people wouldn't even be reading the Bible. A hundred years from now people will not be engaged in Bible study or church. After a hundred years passed and when he died they sold Bibles out of his home because God's word is going to stand. Truth is going to stand. That's why this old story is, is so powerful and pertinent. It, it, it's not like reading the commercial appeal. It's not like reading Jet or Ebony magazine. Many of us will never pick up an old newspaper. We, we want some new news. We want some fresh news. But God's word, after 2,000 years, we still showing up for the same old story. Ain't nothing new here, y'all. It's the same old story. How is it y'all keep coming back for the same old story? You've heard the story. You know the story. But the same old story has life. His word has been declared to be a living word. And his word gives life even as I speak. How many times have you ever gone to church and worship? And the preacher gave the text and you like, oh, man. How many times I heard this? I don't want to hear this story again. But when they finish, you get just what you needed. And sometimes God will draw fresh water 
out of an old well. How many times you've heard the story, but it hits you in a different way? In the season of life you were going through, it meant more to you this time than it did years ago. It's because God's word is a living word. And it will stand even in a society that believes that the Bible is outdated. Have y'all heard that? That the Bible is outdated, but yet it keeps living on. Keep having truth that you and I can live and stand upon. He says, it will not fail. Before one jot or tiller of it shall fail. Heaven and earth shall pass away. And the last I checked, the sun rose in the, in the east. And I believe it's setting in the west. If we wake up in the morning when the sun rises up, it should be a reminder yeah. that God's word is still true. Yeah. And you can stand on God's word. Yeah. I wish I had a few of y'all who know on Christ the solid rock I stand. Yeah. All other ground yeah. is sinking sand. But here's the interesting thing here in verse 19, and you better be careful with verse 19. Not only do we understand the person of truth, the permanency of truth, but then thirdly, we have the practice of truth. Look at verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Now, if you are into just making it in, you know, you hear people about, I don't care where I am. I just want to make it in. If I can just make it in, just let me be a doorkeeper as long as I make it in. I just want to make it in. But a true saint want to pursue greatness. We don't want to be average or mediocrity. We want greatness. I don't know, well, I know most of us know something about graduation. And uh, every time I graduate, I want to graduate with some honors. Y'all remember graduation? Didn't them folks make you look bad when they had all kind of ribbons and stuff on there? I, I mean, you were graduating too, but you wanted something on your lapel. You wanted something... Uh, 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 you wanted your name called first. You, you wanted to be up at the top of the class. Now, I know there is a joy of just graduating. Yeah. Uh, some, some graduate valedictorian, and some graduate, thank you, Lord, at butt. <laughs> Those of us who are serious about our calling don't just want mediocrity. Yeah. We want greatness. And we want to be in the pursuit of greatness. I don't want New Hope to just be an average church with average members doing average things. We should have a pursuit to be great. And greatness don't just start with me. You have to have a vision for greatness. Don't you want to be better? Don't you want to do better? Don't you want to have, oh, well, maybe, maybe I got the wrong crowd. Because you may be one of those that I'm looking at who's saying, if I can just make it in, I just want to make it in. But we hear, we see here in the text, 
there are going to be status even in heaven. And how you going to live a mediocre life and go to heaven and have to be mediocre up there? Have to be less up there? You, you living beneath your means here and you go there, you still got to be. He says here that those who violate my truth don't do these truths, don't teach these truths. You're going to make it, but you're going to be the least. But those who teach it and do it. Now no, notice this is a conjunction. Both teach and do. Because some of us are some good teachers, but we're some poor doers. And it might be the reason why folks ain't following us to church. Because they see what we do over and against what we teach and say. But there must be a connection between what we do and what we say. James declared that we should be hearers. Not only hearers, but doers as well. God is calling for us to be doers of that truth. And I used to say, I used to say, when people know better, they're going to do better. But I've come to know people can know better and still won't do better. But when you hear the truth, truth ought to shift you to want to do better. To want to be better. And I don't care who's preaching it. Or who's teaching it. If it's the truth. Then I want to get in line. With the truth of God. Because I want to be right. With God. I want to be in right fellowship. With God. I might miss being in fellowship with you. But I want to be in right fellowship. With God. And so he declares there are rewards that will be given for those who will honor this truth. Let me leave you when I tell you. I don't got my iPad up here, so I don't know what time it is. But we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna let you go on this point. Here's the bonus point. We must understand the person of truth, the permanency of truth practice of truth. But then lastly, verse 20, the precept of truth. Please look at verse 20 and we done, y'all. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of of heaven. Did y'all catch that? He says, your righteousness must be greater. Supersede Pharisees and scribes. Now I know my Bible readers are already here, but let me help those who don't understand Pharisees and scribes. Pharisees and scribes were the elite religious people of the day. They were looked upon, they revered going to the temple, they paid their tithes, they fasted and prayed. They had all the outer appearances of godliness, holiness, but they omitted the weightier things, as Jesus said on one occasion, of love, mercy, and justice. But he says, listen, this they should have did also, as it relates to Paying tithes, coming to worship, studying God's word. If your righteousness is not above a Pharisee, he says, you ain't fit for the kingdom. That, that, that we got to do that 
plus. But, but here's the essence of the message, though. Understand it's not your religion that's going to get you in. It's the truth of God that's going to give you in. Remember, I said it is the truth that should shape your religion and not your religion shaping your truth. And what they tried to do was use their religion to shape their truth. They were about self-gratification. They were about self-righteousness. And they lowered Jesus, they lowered God's truth to fit their truth and made themselves look good. Made themselves look more than who they are. Now don't look now, but you might know somebody who have a Pharisee mindset. And a Pharisee, I told you don't look now. Who act like Pharisees and scribes. They got it on the outer appearance. But on the inside, they are wicked and corrupt. Because they do not possess what is true. And Jesus is trying to teach, he's trying to share with them. That is not your religion, but your truth. Didn't you hear him say, the truth shall set you free. No, the truth shall make you free. There is a need for us to know and to have the truth of God. Because it's only through the truth that you and I are liberated. And when you hear the truth of God, don't resist it, don't reject it. Embrace God's truth because it will lead you in bondage. John 1, 14 declares, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Let me say that another way. And the truth was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He told the woman at the well in John 4, 24, the day is coming that you will worship me in spirit and in truth. Jesus declared in John around chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit would guide us and lead us into all truth. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what you need more than anything. It is the truth. You, You need to live in truth, walk in truth, serve in truth. Listen, whatever you do, don't live a lie. And living like you want your husband, you want your wife to be the truth and tell you the truth. You want your children to tell you the truth. You want your coworker, your boss to be truth and un. And if we're not living and walking in truth, then we're living in bondage. But I'm glad to report to you we have a Savior, we have a Lord who has set us free. I wish I had a few of y'all who know you a chosen generation, a royal preschool, a peculiar people who have brought you out of darkness into the marvelous light to show forth the praises of him who brought you out of darkness into the marvelous light. If you're walking in the truth and living in the truth, come on, help me give God a strong praise And thank God for his truth. Amen, amen. Come on, stand all over the house. We extend the invitation. We invite you to come. If you're here out of church, need a church home, we invite you to come. We extend the invitation. We thank God for his his truth. That our religion should be founded and based.
based upon the truth of God's word. Anything outside of that is faulty. Anything outside of that is corrupt. Anything outside of that will fail. Thank God for his truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen, amen. Urshas are coming, urshas are coming. Let us get gift, gift in our hands. Represents our tithes and offering. Accept your righteousness.